All right, so good morning once again, and uh, welcome to today's lecture. Today we will be looking at in operations management. So uh, actually this will be our set lecture, but uh, since we have rescheduled some of the, the topics for you to do presentation. So I'm taking this topic today. That is why you see lecture eight there, but in actual fact, it's our sixth uh, lecture. All right, so quickly, these are the learning outcomes and uh, I will not bore you by reading them. I expect that when you get the lecture notes, which are already on the learning management system, you would do that by yourselves. All right, so let's look at what today's topic is all about. So what do we mean by operations in today's uh, world of business? When we say operations, we are making reference to production. So those activities that are involved in making products, so goods and services for our customers. So all the activities that uh, we engage in as businesses or as uh, uh, business owners or companies or institutions to provide goods and services for our customers is what we are terming as operations. Now we can break down operations into service operations and then goods operations. So when you see operations, it is synonymous to what production, all right? So the service operations are those activities which produce intangible and tangible products, such as entertainment, transportation, and education. So tangible here means that you can see, you can feel, or you can smell it. So it's tangible. So for instance, when it comes to um, buying, um, let's say furniture, furniture is, an, is, is, is a good that you can see with your physical eyes, that you can touch, and you can also experience it. But the intangible goods and services, such as entertainment, when you are listening to your favorite uh, song or watching your favorite sports, you do not physically touch it or you are not physically there, but you are enjoying the service or you go for a haircut or a hair, uh, hairdo, we refer to that as what as an intangible word, service or uh, uh, thing that you enjoy. Then with goods or operations, goods that come from uh, physical goods, those are the activities that produce tangible products. So such as we can talk of radio, cell phones, newspapers, vehicles, textbooks, et cetera. All right. Now, what is the term operations management? So operations is simply the production of goods and services. Whereas operations management is concerned with management of the transformation process. So the transformation process is where we are converting inputs into outputs, which we will look at in our next slide. So what is the importance of operations management? One key importance is that it reduces the costs of production. So cost here in the sense that we are able to manage waste efficiently and we're able to schedule production in such a way that we reduce cost of production so inputs that are used for the uh, production process or the transformation process we're able to actually plan effectively and make judicious use of the inputs or the resources and use time and resources effectively operations management or om helps to increase revenue. So once you are minimizing cost, you are maximizing what? Profits. Then it also helps to reduce the amount of investment. So here we are talking about capital that is invested, all right? Then it provides the impetus or the, the direction or the uh, inspiration for new innovation. So how do we innovate? How do we ensure that we are more creative in our production processes so that we reduce waste and maximize profits. Now, there are some key defining terms that are used in OM. So you would hear about operations function. You may hear of operations managers. You may hear of operations management. So these are some key 
terms that you may come across in operations management. So as this illustration shows, uh, operation managers, they draw up plans in order to transform or convert resources into what? Into products. Now, first, they will bring together the basic resources, which are the inputs that we see here. So inputs such as knowledge, physical materials, equipment, human skills, etc. Then they would put those uh, inputs or those uh, resources into what? Into an effective use in a facility where the service is provided or where the physical good is produced. So the transformation activities involves processing of information and data, converting raw materials, solving problems for clients, delivering goods and services. Now, as the demand for products or services increase, then operation managers will schedule and control uh, work to produce the required amount of what the products or the goods. So the event, they will control costs, they will control quality levels, inventory, etc. And then these activities will then churn out the outputs, which is the finished goods and services that will satisfy the customer needs and wants. So at the top here, we see that the four functions of management is there. They plan, they organize, they schedule, they control. So all of these activities is what forms the transformation operations uh transformation process so simply put the resource transformation process so in a nutshell you should be able to describe this process what it is all about how resources or inputs are converted or transformed into final outputs which is goods and services for the satisfaction of what customer needs and wants so if you have any question, you may raise your hand using the icon whilst I move along. All right, so let's look at some OM strategies and performance objectives. So OM focuses on customers' needs and continually formulate strategies and objectives in order to maintain, strengthen, and expand competitive position and customer base. So what it means is that Operation management concerns itself with focusing on the needs of the customer and employing what we call continuous what, improvement. That is where you formulate strategies. We talked about strategies in our last lecture and objectives in order to maintain, strengthen, and expand competitive position and customer base. So this is the main focus or objective of operations management. So there are six customer needs or six main client needs that uh, operations managers are supposed to meet or there are certain expectations that customers have. So first and foremost is higher quality. Customers are always looking for higher quality. The expectation of today's customer is always changing. So for instance, MTN will continue to come out with new services, all right, that would excite their customers. Bank and financial services will always look out for new products or new uh, strategies with by which they can excite their customers. Production or manufacturing firms will also do the same. So that is why you would see that, uh, for instance, a product like fan milk, they keep on adding new innovative what, product lines. Um, you can talk about toothpaste. When I was little, all we knew about toothpaste was one particular flavor, which was the, the mint type. But now you can talk about herbal paste. You can talk about charcoal paste. You can talk about lime paste. All these are innovations that have come out because customers are demanding what? Higher quality. Lower cost. I've mentioned that. As much as possible, managers, operation managers must look at how to reduce costs in order to what to maximize profits then om must also look at shorter lead time lead time is just the period between when a customer places an order 
and receives the order. So you walk into your favorite eatery or restaurant and you place an order at say 10 a.m. You expect that by maximum 25 minutes, your food should be served or should be ready for you to take out. So the lead time is the time between when you place the order and when you receive the order. So as much as possible, OM concerns itself with reducing the lead time. OM is also concerned with greater adaptability. How well are you able to adapt to the changing dynamics of the business environment, to customers' needs, to customers' concerns and wants? How are you able to resolve customers' complaints efficiently within time? Lower variability, so decreasing inconsistency. So your favorite cocoa joint, you know that the taste can be trusted all the time. It is the same. But if you go today and the cocoa is watery, the next day the cocoa is thick. It means there is variability. The, the cocoa seller is not consistent with what delivering the, the porridge. So as much as possible as an operations manager, you should be concerned about reducing variability or lowering it. Then there must be high level of service because there's this uh, philosophy that the customer is always what right or the customer is king or queen. So ensuring that your level of service is on point and is high. Now let's look at the transformation model. So operations function is primarily concerned with the application of resources by means of a transformation process in order to provide outputs or the finished product or goods and services. So the model could apply to both manufacturers and service providers. So there are three main components within the model. You have the inputs, you have the transformation process itself, and the outputs. So this is the diagram where you have your inputs, which are your resources, such as materials that are unprocessed or processed, your customers or your clients, and then information or data. Then these other inputs that need you need some uh, kind of um, process or you need people and facilities to help you in transforming this input. So what aids the process is human resources or people, your equipment and facilities, and then the technology that you would use to convert the inputs into what finished product. So for example, let's say you are a furniture manufacturing company. The inputs that you require would be what? Can someone mention some of the inputs for a furniture manufacturing company? Quickly. You need wood. wood. You need wood. What else? Nails. Okay. Nails. Okay. Okay. So all of oh, these, oh, all of these. Oh, okay, you may mute yourselves now. All of these are some of the inputs that you require. Then you would need the technology. So for instance, there are some equipment that you would need. And then you would need, why am I echoing? A moment, please. A moment, please. Hello. Hello. Hi. Am I echoing at your Am end? Am I echoing at your end? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. I think that's the part. Um, Edward, Edward, my Edward, my Okay, I mean, I need you to mute yourselves if you are not muted. Yourself. Yeah, no, no. Thank you. All right, so what aids the transformation process is that the human resource, so the employees or the, the human beings, all right, the equipment and the facilities. So even the, 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 the layout where you're going to actually do the whole production, the assembling and everything, then the technology. So it could be that there is a new technology that is used to treat the wood, to make sure that the wood doesn't uh, get destroyed. Now, once you have all of these inputs, then you go through to the environment where you do the transformation. And then you come up with your finished product, which is the 
furniture. Is that okay? Okay, so let's look at, okay, so these are all the inputs that you require, the resources that are required to make the transformation possible. Then the transformation process is where the inputs are converted into output in the transformation process. So we can have three types of resource inputs. The transformation of materials, that is raw materials, transformation of information, and then transformation of customers or clients. So for instance, information, when you go to the hospital, at the front desk at the OPD, you, you are asked to provide your data. So your name, the nurse attendant there will take your vitals, your temperature, your, um, what else, your blood pressure, your weight, all of that is information that will be used to process your, for instance, your medication, because that information will be sent, will be or kept on your folder, whether electronically or, or manually, and the doctor will use the information there to, to uh, what is it, to diagnose your condition, probably some lab uh, test will be run, and the information that is then derived from the lab test will be used to what, to uh, diagnose your condition and then provide you with the medication. Then transformation of customers. So for instance, you as students are customers of GCT. You are currently in the transformation process. You are quote unquote inputs, all right? You are being transformed to become what graduates or to come out as graduates with what degrees and diplomas and what have you. So these are how inputs are addressed in the transformation process. Then the output is the ultimate goal of transformation process because you want to convert or process inputs into what? Into outputs. However, the characteristics of products manufactured and services provided, they differ. So let's look at some of the characteristics between products and services. So products are produced by the manufacturer, whereas services are produced by the, the service provider. So the products or the goods are physically tangible and durable where our services are intangible and perishable. So for instance, right now, I'm delivering a service, a lecture. You cannot feel it, you cannot see it, or you cannot touch it, but you are experiencing it. Once I'm done with this lecture, it's over. But thanks to technology, it's being recorded, so you can still play back. But when it's a physical or tangible good, like a table or a chair or a car, you can feel it, you can touch it. Physical goods can be kept in stock, but services cannot be kept in stock. When goods are produced, there is little customer contact. So when the furniture company or the uh, mineral water or mineral drink company is bottling the product, the customer is not present during the production or the transformation process. So there is little contact with the customer. But when it comes to service, there's a lot of contact with the customer. So when you walk into a barbering shop or a salon, you are in direct contact with the what, with the uh, with the, the the service provider. The manufactured when it comes to the goods, it is manufactured before it is used. But with the service, the provision and consumption is done simultaneously. So, as I'm lecturing, you ex you are actually. Uh, using the service or you experience the service whilst it's being provided. And so the rest, these are very self-explanatory. Uh, the, there's a long response time with, with manufacturer, whereas there's a short response time. Uh, local and international markets, it can be provided when it's a tangible or a good. Uh, for services, it's mainly the, the local markets. And for goods, there's a large production facility. So especially when you go to these uh, car assembly plants and uh, uh, bottling manufacturing and other goods that are manufactured, they are done at very large production facilities, whereas with services, it's much smaller. There's much capital intensive involved or the, the, the capital is more intensive with uh, products, whereas it is more labor intensive with services. And you can easily measure quality with products, whereas for 
uh, services, it's much difficult to measure uh, quality. Any questions so far with the characteristics? Madam. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, please. I want to ask a question. Okay. Yeah. So if any question drops under characteristics of products and service, can we still put it in a table form or? No, please. You have to write as university students. So if okay. you say physical goods are tangible, you should illustrate probably with an example. So if the full yeah. mark is two, you probably get just one if you state it. So you okay. should explain why it is tangible because you are differentiating between. So the question, it, it depends if the question, if I'm asking you to differentiate. So you would say that products are tangible, whereas services are intangible. Then you illustrate with an example. Is that okay? Okay. All right. Any other questions? Um, please, I want to ask that why is it that a service provider that is, is mainly a local market? Come again. I want to know why is the service provide the service produced mainly a, lo a, a local market? Oh, it's more concentrated. It doesn't mean it cannot be uh, given in the international. So for instance, MTN is, is, is not just local, but oftentimes services are provided in the local market. So for instance, uh, it, it will be in the sense that now that technology has advanced, you are able to offer your service. So for instance, I could be lecturing students outside Ghana. You understand? Uh -huh. It doesn't mean that services cannot put, but more often or not, they are provided locally. So for instance, your favorite watch it joint, your, um, where you watch your football games and what have you, those services are mostly provided on the local markets. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay, I don't see any hands raised, so let me move on. Okay, now we want to look at some of the classification of process types for manufacturers. So manufacturing, I have said, is vis-a-vis uh, -vis production, okay? So there are five categories that have been identified. So let's look at them one after the other. So we have the project process. So examples are construction of routes. Okay, so these are processes that involve projects. So a road construction is more of a project. So for instance, if you are constructing a 100 kilometer road, it, it can be done within a short period of time. So they are done on project basis. So for instance, you have a contract, contract uh, the contract is awarded to a firm. So maybe two firms, one firm is responsible for constructing the drainage systems for the road. Another is uh, contracted to do the, the 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 layout or the filling, and another contractor is con contracted to do the actual uh, asphalt. So you see that it's done in projects based on uh, projects. Then we can also talk about the jobbing process. So this is where you produce unique products with specific requirements for customers. So it's a one-off production, like a building. So for instance. Uh, a, 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 as an organization, you contract a, a, a contractor to put up an office space. Once the office space has been built, the project is done. Uh, or the the yeah, it's it's also a project though, but the product is done. So, for instance, it's a building. Maybe you are asking a, a real estate company to put up a two bedroom apartment for you. Once they have finished that production, it's done. Okay. Then the batch process is where you produce uh, products in batches. So for instance, like bakeries, okay? So I'm familiar with bakeries because my, my mom is a caterer and we run a bakery. So for instance, the first batch is maybe butter bread. So we produce the dough we, or we make the dough and then it is done. Then the second batch could be brown bread or sugar bread or pastries. So it's done in batches. Then we have mass production. 
or mass processes, which is production of large amounts of standardized products. So for instance, fuel, cars, these are done on very large scales. Then we also have the continuous or the repetitive systems. This is where production of goods is done without interruption. So it is a form of mass production. So for instance, the oil and gas industry is an example of continuous or uh, repetitive systems. All right, so the next illustration are examples of uh, projects that are, cla sorry, classification of manufacturers operational processes. So you realize that when it comes to variety, uh, for projects, there is high variety and volume is also what is quite low. So construction of projects and bridges, development projects, upgrading projects, the variety level is high. But if you look at the volume that they churn out, it's very low. Uh, for jobbing pro uh, processes, yes, the variety is somehow high and the volume is also a little bit in between low and high, so medium. Uh, for batch processes, we have variety being averagely high and the volume also averagely high. But mass production and continuous product, you see that the volume is high, but the variety is low. So the dotted lines are what is being referred to as multiple unit projects. So some projects could be, uh, so some process could be project and also what continuous, whereas it could be project and what batch. All right. So they could be there could be a multiple unit project as well. All right. Now when we look at the components of products and uh, services, we we'll realize that products or services broadly defined as anything that can be offered to a customer in order to satisfy that customer's needs. So the products and services consist of three independent components. First, there's an idea or a concept. So there must be a concept about the product or idea. So for instance, we know that uh, when uh, that in the tourism sector or the tourism industry, tourists are looking for what? Fun or relaxation or a, a pleasure. So what, what would be the business idea? You want to provide pleasure or uh, you want to provide tourists with what? Exciting, maybe holiday packages. So you must conceive the idea or the concept first. Then you package the idea or this, this package composition. How do you package the idea or the concept or the service? Then there's a process for creating the package. All right, so these are the three components or the three uh, yeah, components that are involved in what coming out with a product or a service. So first you must conceive an idea or have a concept. Then you package that uh, idea you, you present it in a, in a way that is marketable or sellable, and then you create the process for which you are going to deliver the package or the product. Then we have the nature of operations planning and control. Now, remember that it is important that within the process or the transformation process, we have plans in place and there must be control mechanisms to ensure that the demand, we are able to meet the demand or the supply meets the demand. So you see that we have supply of products and services by the operations process of the business. And then we have demand for products and services by the customers or clients of the business. Now, in between the supply and demand, we must plan and control the whole operational processes. So all those activities that will reconcile supply and demand in terms of volume, timing, and quality. So when customers make demand and we are unable to meet their demand, then there is excess demand over supply. And that can result in customers maybe moving or switching to other uh, businesses. And when the supply exceeds the demand too, there can be a mismatch. So we must reconcile supply and demand in terms of the volume, the timing, and the quality. It's very key 
for planning and control of the operational process. Then there is also cap need for capacity planning and control. So this focuses on the provision of manufacturing and or service capacity of a particular operations process. So capacity is the maximum level of value added activity over a period of time that the process can achieve under normal operating circumstances. So for example, the capability of a worker, a machine, a work center, a plant or an organization to produce output in a time period. So sometimes as students, we say that, oh, my learning capacity is just one hour. Me the monsieur and they one hour penna my bread or two hours per, then I'm done. That is your capacity as what as a student. A machine or a cap a, 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 what do you call it? A work center may have the capacity to produce, let's say, textile fabrics for let's say 12 hours. After 12 hours, the machine will have to go on break. So that's what we are talking about, the, the, the capacity. So the maximum level of value added activity over a period of time that the process can achieve under normal operating work circumstances. So examples of capacity, let's say a law firm. So the capacity measure will be the billable hours available each month. So for instance, the law firm has just two lawyers or three lawyers. So if they can only take two cases in a month, it means they can't exceed the two cases in a month. So the factors that are affecting their capacity to take more cases is the number of lawyers and paralegals, even their educational and skill level, they are supporting software. So there are factors that can you know, affect the capacity of an organization. If you take a textile plant, the number of spinning hours that they can produce or the number of hours per shift that can be produced per week. So the factors that can affect their capacity is the number of machines that are running, the quality of the raw materials, and even maintenance culture. If they are not regularly maintaining their equipment, that can also result in breakdown in their capacity. Uh, an automatic car wash, the capacity measure will be the number of cars they wash per hour. The factors that will affect them is the availability of water, uh, the chemicals, or the the in our in our this is more of an American example because in Ghana I've not seen many automatic car washes wash bays. So maybe it will be the labor those who are there to wash the car. They call them a is it car? There's a name they call them. It has escaped me. So all these are just examples of capacity. Then in operations management, in addition to planning and control, we need to ensure quality. Now, some people have argued that quality is, it, it, it differs, what quality means to me might differ for, uh, to what quality means to another person. But in, in, in the manufacturing process, quality is one of the main methods of adding value to the, the products and even in services. So from an operations management perspective, quality is defined as consistent conformity. Uh, I should have underlined or bolded this, but take the key word is that consistent what conformity to customers or clients' expectations. So we have what we call the quality gap. The quality gap is the difference between expected quality and perceived quality. So let's say, for instance, you have placed order for your favorite pizza. And you know that it has a particular taste. And on a particular day, you place the order and it is not up to point like the way you usually know it. That is the quality gap, all right? Or you have, uh, you are into uh, manufacturing and then you need some, uh, you've placed order for materials and then the materials this time were substandard. Then there's a quality gap. So operations management in conjunction with other functional areas must endeavor to eliminate any quality gaps within the manufacturing or the service uh, process. It's very key that you focus on quality. So there's a, a system for ensuring or managing quality and it's referred to as TQM or total quality management. And it involves all those activities which are involved in getting high quality goods and services into the marketplace. 
So it begins first with leadership. Uh, leadership and also a desire for continuous improvement, both processes, products, and play. It starts from leadership. So leadership must have that philosophy of what? Ensuring that quality is at every stage of the money of the process. All right. How we ensure that we buy the right quality materials. We ensure that we eliminate quality gaps. We ensure that we provide the best service. So in GTUC, we have a quality assurance unit to ensure that delivery of lecture, lectures, uh, all the facilities that are required for effective teaching and learning are in place. So TQM identifies the sources that cause unsatisfactory uh, quality and then assigns responsibility for corrections and ensures that those who are responsible for taking the steps of improving quality are on you know, top of their game. So one of the biggest challenge when it comes to uh, TQM is how to motivate employees and also how to ensure that the suppliers are also able to achieve quality goals. So it is important that leaders of quality movement use various methods and uh, resources to foster a quality focus. So training, verbal encouragement, teamwork, uh, making sure that you compensate people when they, they, they actually work hard to ensure quality. So all these efforts uh, to succeed, making sure the employees and suppliers will own the idea of quality it's important. So as a manager, you must ensure that you inculcate this uh, culture, this uh, practice or philosophy into your employees. It's a, it's, it's a challenge, but you must be able to rise to the task. So TQM is a management philosophy with a primary aim of satisfying needs and expectation of customers or clients by means of high quality products and or service. So the focal point of TQM is the underlying process that, that occurs at each customer and supplier interface. So as a student, when you were applying, your interface between admissions office, when you applied, when you submitted your form, or when you paid for your form online, or whichever means you used to apply, when you got your admission letter, to when you registered your courses, and as every process, until you graduate and you are coming back for your trans, all of these processes must be ensured that the customer is satisfied. So TQM is a very important management philosophy. So these are some of the uh, definitions or some of the uh, underlying factors under TQM. So you must meet the needs and expectations of customers. It's very important. So defining TQM means that you must meet customer needs and expectations. You must even strive to exceed customer expectation. All right. Making sure that as a business, you are covering all the parts of the business, regardless of how small they are. So even if you are just a one-man business or a sole proprietor, you must ensure that you cover all the various parts of the business to ensure that you are delivering quality. Making every employee in the business quality conscious. So quality consciousness, ensuring that every worker is aware and conscious and practicing what quality. Identifying and accounting for all the costs of quality. So eliminating quality gaps, ensuring that from the onset you are implementing measures to ensure that we are practicing TQM. Doing the things right the first time. So from the onset, making sure you are doing right things the first time. You don't, you eliminate errors as much as possible. Develop and implement systems and procedures for quality. How do you ensure that you check for quality? So in GCTU, we have what we call faculty evaluation. All right. So at the end of the semester or during, I think midway in the semester, students will be asked to evaluate or assess faculty. So uh, we, you'll be sent questionnaires to, you know, uh, answer your, your um, experience, you know, 
with the, the service delivery, okay? So all of these are systems and procedures for quality what control or quality management. Then establishing a continuous process for improvement, okay? Making sure that on a continuous basis, you are putting in measures to ensure that there is continuous improvement. There is no particular point in time where you, uh, you say that now we have arrived. If you look at a, a company like Toyota, they practice TQM. So every time Toyota is coming out with a new model, they are always improving on their previous version. The same applies to companies like tech companies like uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, Apple. They are always improving on the previous what, uh, version of Apple phone or uh, Microsoft computer. So these are some review questions that you can discuss in your free time. So I'll stop sharing here and I'll I'll stop recording. If you have any questions, uh, I know I may have moved a bit fast.